Uh, hi everybody, uh, here and online. I'm titling this talk, Fusing Race and Class, and I mean it both descriptively and as the basis for resistance. So descriptively, what I'm going to argue is that race and class have been fused as tightly as welded steel. That's what dog whistle politics does. It's a language about race that also scares people about government, that in turn leads many white voters to hand over government to the very rich. Race and class, surging racial anxiety, and also surging wealth inequality in the United States over the last 50 years, same damn story. And that means that if we're going to resist, we too must figure out how to fuse race and class. Okay? That's the only way to defeat dog whistle politics. Dog whistle politics, basic outline. Use coded racism to push race into the political conversation. It's important that it's coded. This is a phenomenon that starts in response to the civil rights movement. Prior to that, Race was a big part of our political conversation, but it was explicit. But the very point of the civil rights movement was, at least partly, to change the moral calculus around open expressions of white supremacy. To say that's no longer acceptable. That did not mean that endorsements of white supremacy or white solidarity disappeared from American politics. They changed form. They went from open defenses of segregation, Jim Crow segregation, white over black segregation, to coded conversations about states' rights. Right? As if the issue was state-federal relationships rather than the federal order that states stop segregating. Right? So, the, so what we get is a language of coded racism. Second, this coded racism became a way not only to scare white voters about people of color, but to get them to turn against the idea of liberal government as something that helps regular people. So this is coming out of the New Deal, the Great Society programs. This is Lyndon Johnson promising to end poverty in a generation and winning in a landslide. Government was geared to helping people, except up through the 1960s, government was largely geared to helping whites. When government was limited to helping whites, whites supported the idea of government intervention, of government restrictions on market actors and on monopolies, on government support for unions. This new language of racial fear gave concentrated wealth an opening that they could exploit, not just to win some elections, but to turn many white voters against the idea that government could actually help people. Right? And, so this, and so this attack on government is precisely what allows vote, what, what we see is you, you build popular support where many white voters are voting for billionaires whose stated goal is turn government over to the very rich, to concentrate a wealth to corporations. Right? This is how that happens. Last, it's not enough for politicians to compete with each other on the campaign trail about how dangerous people of color are. They've got to prove it. And the way you prove it is you compete in turning the state into an anvil that, against which you can hammer communities of color. And so you get mass incarceration. So mass incarceration, when Richard Nixon starts dog whistling in the 1970s, we incarcerated roughly 200,000 people. Now it's 2.3 million. We have 1 20th the world's population, 1 quarter the world's prisoners. We incarcerate people at five times the highest rate of Europe. Why? Because politicians needed to prove to anxious white voters that they could be tougher on thugs than the next guy. Right? So if you want to understand what's happened to communities of color, and this is, this is mass incarceration, this is welfare, this is mass deportation, this is just about anything associated with people of color. For example, infrastructure, inner cities, public education, all of those things you've seen politicians competing with each other to prove how tough they can be on people of color. The repercussions for communities of color have been especially destructive. But of course, everybody has lost in this process. Right? So these are the main three elements of dog whistling. This is what the country has been doing for 50 years. This is the story I lay out in, in my book, Dog Whistle Politics. 
And this is Donald Trump.